Amen. Thank you all tonight for the singing. Now turn in your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Luke. Dr. Luke. Tonight, the 17th chapter. The Gospel of Luke, chapter number 17. Brother Don Stone asked me tonight how I was going to shorten that in ten points. So just for him tonight, I'm going to double it. <laughs> Luke chapter number 17, verse number 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here, or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And he said unto the disciples, The days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you shall not see it. And they shall say to you, See here, or see there, go not after them, nor follow them. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one, one part of the under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. I want to talk to you again tonight on the coming of our Lord. And I want to share with you this evening... Um, some things pertaining to that. How we know He's coming. Why He must come again. Our Savior, when He walked here upon this earth, often spoke about the kingdom. One Bible study of the Old Testament Scriptures will reveal that something has yet been promised by God that has, been, has not been brought to fruition. As you study, for instance, the, one of the key books in the Old Testament is the book of Isaiah. As you study the book of Isaiah, as you study the book of Ezekiel, as you study the book of Daniel, as you study the last book of Malachi in the Old Testament, and of course many of the minor prophets, you come to the conclusion that God said something about a kingdom that at this point in the history of the world has never been implemented. Back there we learned that a very familiar passage of Scripture, we use it around Christmas time a lot, talk about the animal kingdom is going to have its nature changed. A little child will walk down the street, pick up a snake, carry the snake. Uh, some dumb adults do that today. Some crazy churches do that today. But there will come a day when bear and the lamb, for instance, will lie down beside of each other and the bear will not have a nature to destroy the lamb. God said there will be no hurt in all of the earth. There will be a day, the Bible says in the Old Testament Scriptures, that uh, there will be uh, peace uh, in the land. The men will learn war no more. Uh, there will be a time when you reach in to get a strawberry or a blackberry, and there will be no thorns. Thorns are a part of the curse. There will be a day when people don't grow old any longer, living right here on this earth. There will be a day 
right here on this earth when death will not be present. And on and on and on. I could spend a lot of time on it. And Jesus talked about the kingdom. It's very noteworthy and very truthful that Jesus came and presented the kingdom to Israel. And Israel rejected the king. Now, if you read the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew wrote his gospel from a kingdom aspect. Gospel of Matthew is the gospel of the king. If you read the Sermon on the Mount, that is the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, Mark wrote his gospel from the standpoint of Jesus being a servant. If you read the Gospel of Mark, there's no genealogy. Mark uses the word straightway or immediately over and over. And Matthew and Luke says, let me show you that Jesus is the Messiah by his genealogy. Mark said, let me show you that he's the Messiah by getting you into the actions of his ministry, into the miracles and the teachings of Jesus. Dr. Luke wrote about Jesus from his manward aspect. Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. John wrote his gospel from the aspect that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You read down towards the latter part of John, he said, These things are written, these miracles, these signs, that you might know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing on His name you might have life and eternal life. So, so Matthew wrote his gospel from the kingdom point of view. He gave the genealogy to associate Jesus with the kingdom. And he talked about the miracles of the king. And he talked about the teachings and the preaching of the king. But uh, as Jesus referenced the kingdom, people began to ask him the question in verse number 20 of chapter 17. And when, he, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come. Now, they did not see in Jesus what they anticipated in the king that would be over the kingdom. They thought that the king would come in, come in riding a big white steed, and with his power he would conquer Roman oppression, and that he would establish his throne and put down all rebellion. And that immediately he would become the king and set up and establish his kingdom. But they didn't see that. They couldn't see that in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because with him, from their perspective, the lost world's perspective, there was no splendor associated with him. From the lost world's perspective, there were no signs in earth and heaven that Joel talked about in the Old Testament Scriptures. And Jesus attacked their religion rather than affirming their religion. And that became a great, great thorn uh, and a burr under their saddle. The very religion that the religious leaders of that day, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, thought Jesus would use to establish the kingdom, Jesus rejected. And Jesus said, you are living in the, in the tradition of the elders, but not... In the tradition of scriptures, they had thousands of man-made dogmas when Jesus came, and uh, they had uh, they had made divorce, for instance, so, so simple that if a woman burnt the bread, the husband could get a divorce. There'll be a lot of that now. I want you to notice the understanding here that Jesus gave to that generation. Jesus said something. I hope, you haven't over, I hope you have not read over this. But Jesus said something that's astounding. Jesus said in our text verse, watch this closely, that the kingdom is here, but not as you suppose. And I want to say it again. He said the kingdom is here, not as you suppose. Now hold your place just a minute and turn to the book of Acts, chapter number 1. That great ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verse number 6, 
they raised the question again. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Is the bear and the lamb going to be able to lie down together? Is the curse going to be lifted? Are you going to establish your throne? Is the, de is the desert going to blossom like the rose? Is there going to be peace among nations? Are people going to learn war no more? Lord, are you going to establish the kingdom now? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know. The times are the seasons which the Father hath put in His own power. So right up to the point of His ascension, they're asking the question about the kingdom. Now Jesus said in verse number 20, that the kingdom comes not with observation. It doesn't come by looking around and seeing things. Our verse number 21, it doesn't come because somebody comes on the scene and says, I'm Jesus. Somebody comes and says, well, he's over here. Just a few weeks ago, a man came into Texas. He said, I'm Jesus. He got a following. I had a preacher friend that used to pastor here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, years ago. And uh, he said that if the devil came to Winston-Salem and walked down the streets of the city, that one of the local colleges would have him over there to lecture before the week was out. Now, it's amazing what kind of following idiots can get. Here's a guy came to our country a few weeks ago, claimed to be Christ. People are following him and passing out in his presence and saying, I've lived for this day. I have now seen the Messiah like Anna and Simeon over in the Gospel of Luke. And Simeon said, took the baby in his arms. He said, now I can go to heaven. I've been able to hold the God-man in my arms. I'm ready to go to heaven. Well, that little babe was God. That little babe grew up and proved to the world that he was God. Still is God. But now he said some things. He said, I want you to understand something. This kingdom is not, first of all, coming with signs to be observed. Now what Jesus is saying here is that the kingdom, the first phase of the kingdom, is not, first of all, external. The first phase of the kingdom is not, first of all, universal. The first phase of the coming is not physical. But notice where he said the first part of the kingdom age is in verse number 21. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now there will be an external kingdom. But right now, the subjects that will be a part of the external kingdom are the subjects that have God living in them. Now let's get a hold of that. If you're going to be a part of the kingdom that is to come, you don't become an Armstronger. There used to be a program on at midnight. And uh, get my radio voice here. The World Tomorrow with Herbert W. Armstrong. There's a new world coming. Kind of spooky. <clears throat> well, the truth of the matter is, there is a new world coming, but not as people suppose, some people suppose, verse 20 and 21. In order to be a part of that kingdom, we have to be initiated into that kingdom with a new birth. And that means that it dwells within us. There is an internal kingdom, that is the kingdom of righteousness that lives inside of the believer. The first kingdom is associated with his first coming. The second kingdom will be associated with his second coming. And those that are associated with him in his first coming will be able to rule with him in his second coming. It's just a fact. Now, what is it that demands he come again? Don, here's my thin boy. What is it tonight that demands that he come again? First of all, for his church, and then seven years later, with his church. 
Now, we here at Berean Baptist Church, in case somebody should ask you what you believe, I hope you know. I hope you don't say, I believe what my preacher believes. I hope you know why you believe what you believe. We are not post-millennials. We are not mid-tribulationists. We are, in theological terms, we are pre-trib. Pre-trib meaning that we believe, I preached it this morning, got two points on that message I need to go back and visit. Didn't get done. But we preached this morning four reasons why we are looking for Jesus to come and four attitudes towards His coming. The truth is, we believe that we have been delivered from the wrath to come. We believe in Romans 8 and 1, there's no condemnation to those of us that are in Christ Jesus. We believe that we are waiting for the soon arrival, maybe today, the arrival of Jesus Christ, who shall deliver us, who shall deliver us from the wrath to come. Now, with that in mind, point number one, point number one, why is it that we know that he must come again? Because, listen closely, because the promises of God demand that He come again. The promises of God demand that He come again. Now let's look at it just a moment. Turning your Bibles into the Old Testament Scriptures into the book of 2 Samuel. The book of 2 Samuel, chapter number 7. The story here is that Nathan the prophet has gone down to the house of David. And David is to be king. And he has, he has commissioned David uh, with some information that not only had to do with David's reign, but had to do with one of David's greater son's reign, namely Jesus Christ. For instance... Hold your place in 2 Samuel, don't lose it, some of you just now found it, and turn to the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament. And notice, if you will, in Luke chapter number 1, what the Bible says in verse number 32, talking about speaking of Jesus, He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto Him, watch this, the throne of his father, David. Now, they said that Jesus will sit on the throne of David. Hadn't happened yet. So we know that the Old Testament promise that's not been fulfilled demands that Jesus come in order that that promise might be fulfilled. And the promise to David is the Davidic covenant. And it's found here in the seventh chapter of Second Samuel. First of all, in verse number 13, He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, God promised to David that his posterity would never be diminished. God said, David, you're going to have posterity as long as the world continues. And Jesus Christ, we just found that, and if you look in the genealogies, you'll find that Jesus Christ was in the genealogy of David, and he's the only one that's the living heir today to sit upon David's throne to fulfill that wonderful promise that David's kingdom would be established and that he would have a posterity that would endure for as long as this world stands. And ladies and gentlemen, listen to me tonight. This is shouting ground for badness on Sunday night. The truth of the matter is, God's Word cannot lie, and He has promised that one day His Son will sit on that throne, and it didn't happen at the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, since God has promised it, then Jesus must come again to fulfill the promise to the house of David that His Son will sit upon His throne. He promised him several things. He promised him posterity in verse 13. Also in verse 13, he promised him a throne. Look, notice, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. 
there's royal authority tagged to what Nathan said to David. There will be a day when his son will sit upon a throne. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm amazed at people that can't figure it out. The writing is as if it's in neon lights as to what's happening in the world. And people can't see it because they don't look through scriptural interpretation to figure out what's happening. It's not by accident that the Middle East is converging on Jerusalem. It's not by accident that we had the 1967 war. It's not by accident that even our president has tried to give away portions of that holy city. It's not by accident that they cannot come together and formulate a peace agreement that has any length of time to it because the devil wants to thwart the plan of God. Anybody ought to be able to see that. Jerusalem is the hot spot of the world. Why? Because it's at Jerusalem that the Old Testament Scriptures and the Old Testament prophets have stated that Jesus Christ will rule from that city. And the devil don't want it to happen, but the devil's an idiot. And he don't have enough sense and mentality to know that the whippings he's already got, whoopings in country language, that the whippings that he's already got from God uh, are not sufficient to give that dumb idiot enough understanding and revelation to know that in spite of all he's trying to do to stop the plan of God with the Jewish nation, he's still going to falter and he's still going to fail. King Jesus is still going to rule and reign in Jerusalem. It's an Old Testament promise. Therefore, he must come back because if he don't, the Bible is not so. He's going to have a throne. The Bible says that the nations of the world are going to go up, and they're going to worship Jesus, <laughs> not Allah. They're not going to bow down before a dumb, dead God. They're going to bow down before a living Jesus. This world detests Him. Sad to say our own country is ashamed of Him. One of these days, the nations of the world will run up to Jerusalem and they will bow down and bring their gifts up to Jerusalem, the Old Testament prophet said, and they will acknowledge that the king is reigning in Zion. Jesus is going to reign there. And here, Nathan said to David that you will have a posterity, and secondly, that you will have a throne, and one of your sons will sit upon that throne. And I've got good news for you tonight, church. Those of us that are saved by the grace of God, we're going to be a part of that reign. And we're going to reign with King Jesus right here on this earth with the curse lifted. We're coming back with him in the 19th chapter of the book of the Revelation. I like what Lakin said years ago. They said, how do you think? Some little liberal squirt said to him, how do you think that a horse can walk on air? He said, can you make one to walk on land? I like the atheist talking to God and said, I do anything you can do. He said, yeah. I said, really? Yeah. I said, I'd make man, I'd create man like you can. He said, all right, let's do it. God said, okay, you go first. The atheist reached down to get some dirt, and God said, hold it. Get your own dirt. Man can't even make dirt from which he came. Amen. Now watch this. God is coming because of the promises. He's going to have a posterity. He's going to have a throne. Look at verse 16 of 2 Samuel chapter 7. And thine house and thy kingdom. Oh, hallelujah. Shall be established 
forever before thee. Notice, forever. Those that follow the lonely Nazarene belong to the forever crowd. In the book of Acts, they call the Christians that way. If you read the book of Acts, they'll say, that way, that way. Well, we are the that way crowd. We are the kingdom crowd without the Jehovah's Witnesses on the front of it. We are the kingdom. We know who the king is. Turn with me to the book of Timothy for just a minute or two. Uh, this stuff uh, is coming to me so fast, I can't get it out. Thank you, Lord. Now, what, look at this. Uh, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. I mean, I feel just like, almost like reading this verse of Scripture and giving an invitation. And preaching the next point, Don, next Sunday night. I want you to look at this. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 15. Well, let's look at verse 15. <laughs> that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Watch verse 15. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, in time. Everybody's going to know who the king is. Everybody's going to know who the potentate is. He don't sit in Rome. Right now he sits on the right hand of the Father. I believe he's about ready to get up. I believe he's about ready to descend, and we will ask him. He's coming down, and we're going up. He's going to shout, and some of you will follow him in shouting. He's saying it, not me, preacher. I'm going to be right at your side, remember, on the way up. I'm going to punch you in the ribs and say, I told you so, after you shout. Now watch this. Verse number 16, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be glory and power everlasting. Amen. We've got the only king. We've got the only potentate. Our Savior is the only one that has immortality, unending life dwelling in Him. We're mortal, but He's immortal. <laughs> and one day we'll be immortal. Thank God. What a king. <laughs> what a king. Now, Let's move over to another verse of Scripture in Psalm chapter 2. Thank you, Lord. Look here. Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2 is a messianic psalm that has to do with this kingdom era when Jesus will reign. And it, it dovetails from the present into the future. Look with me, for instance, in uh, verse number 2. The kings of the earth, they set themselves... And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointing, saying, Let us break the bands of sun. In other words, we do not want this king ruling over us, Jesus. And the kings come together. And uh, they say all kinds of things against Him. And verse number 4, God calls an emergency council session to see what are we going to do. Look at verse number 4. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. <laughs> Amen. I feel a message coming on. The laughter of God. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. They'll be so out of balance, they won't even be able to balance. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath. Look at this. Well, our Jesus is a loving, little loving sin. You know, he's going to speak in his wrath. He's going to speak in his wrath. His laughter is, will be turned, his laughter will be turned into wrath. 
I want you to notice what he says in verse number 6. With people making fun of his king. With people saying there's nothing to Jesus. With people saying you don't pray in that name. We, we, are, uh, we are a, must be a culturally, culturally acceptable group of people that makes room for Buddha. We must make room for Confucius. We must make room for Allah. We must make room for uh, Judaism. We must make room for all other religions of the world because after all, all one religion is just as good as the other. God says, I've got something to say to you. You kings that are in derision, you kings that are mocking my son, I've got something to say to you. In verse number 6, I'm going to set him. I'm going to exalt him. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Now, listen, he reigns tonight. Thank God he reigns tonight over the circle of this earth. And one day he's going to reign sitting on this earth. He's going to reign from Zion. That's a word for Jerusalem. And Jesus Christ in the book of Zechariah will come in the 13th chapter. And the Bible said that He descends to the Mount of Olives. Why does He come to the Mount of Olives? Why didn't He go to some other mountain? Because it was at the Mount of Olives where the kings of this world conspired against the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Paul said in the New Testament, they crucified the Lord of glory and there on Golgotha's hill they nailed God to the cross. But when he comes back, he's coming to the place of derision. When he comes back, he's coming to the place of crucifixion. And when he comes back, he's coming to the place of rejection. But he's not coming back to be crucified. He's not coming back to be nailed to a Calvary's cross. When he comes back, he comes to the place where he was crucified. He comes where he was rejected. And he comes as King Jesus to set up his reign in the city and to reign on the circles of this earth uh, from the very place where the kings of this world crucified him. Yeah, he's not coming to bow his head. He's coming with a royal diadem on his head. Yeah. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Now notice, it's in past tense. I have said. How do you know he's coming? In his economy, it's already happened. And when God says, I have, for us, it may be he will, but our he wills is already his I have. Because what God writes prophecy as if it's history. God looks at the future. And God says this is the decree. God looks at the future and said this is the way it's going to be. And I'll go ahead and record it. As if it's already happened, although it hasn't. But God's Word decrees. And it will. And Jesus is going to reign. Amen, amen. Jesus is going to reign. When Jesus came, there was a minimum of 300 prophecies in the Old Testament Scripture. Surrounded his coming. Get it? Over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament scriptures. Remember, I'm saying, well, I'm on my first point. Don, you're right. I won't get very far. But I want you to remember, there are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament. That's the reason he's got to come again. Those words of prophecy haven't all been fulfilled. As a matter of fact, about a hundred of those prophecies pertaining to his death and his life was fulfilled the first time. There's about 200 more yet to be fulfilled. Do you think God will not fulfill his promises pertaining to his son? They're going to be fulfilled. When he comes again, he's going to finish up the slate. Amen. He's coming. 
The promises of God demands that Jesus come. If Jesus did not come, then it would mean that his integrity is questionable. If Jesus did not come, it would mean that his credibility is false. No one can accuse God of having no integrity. No one can accuse God of not being credible. The truth of the Scriptures demands that Jesus Christ come again. Now, I can go on and on. I don't want to weary you with the point, but I could go on and on. I know He's got to come again because the promises of God in the Old Testament demand that He come. Secondly, the teachings of Jesus demands that He come again. The teachings of Jesus demand that He come again. Now come back to the book, the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament. Luke chapter number 21, please. I read, uh, I want to read something to you. Luke chapter number 21, verse number 25. There shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth distresses of nation with perplexity. The sea and the waves roar, and men's hearts fell in them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Look at that phrase. The teachings of Jesus demand that He come again, because He Himself said that they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Is Jesus a liar? Absolutely not. Whatever He says is what He will do. He says He's coming again. Yeah. Now, it's very interesting. People get confused a lot of times here. It doesn't take a lot to confuse some people. But I want you to notice... It says that they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, turn with me to the book of the Revelation, chapter 1. Verse just comes to my mind again here. Uh, Revelation chapter number 1. Uh, verse number 7. Revelation 1, 7. Behold, He cometh with clouds. Look at this. And every eye shall see Him. And they also which pierced Him. And all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. Now, here again, the Bible said he's coming and every eye is going to see him. Now, you know and I know, Brother Smith, when the rapture takes place, not every eye is going to see him. So, is that a contradiction of terms? No. When you rightly divide the word of truth, you understand as I said earlier, that His coming is twofold yet. The next time He comes, He comes to the church, listen, as a thief. Seven years later, He comes with His church, and every eye will see Him. And they which pierced Him will see Him. Either way, whether it's the rapture or the revelation... He's coming. He's coming because He said He's coming. He's coming. Another verse of Scripture. Brother Clayton, I like this. Turn to the book of Jude. That's just before the revolution. Revelation. Look at Jude 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these saying. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Notice what Jude said. Jude said, the Lord's coming. And notice what he said. He's coming with ten thousands of his saints. Let me tell you what that means. When those men of God writing the Scriptures, when they were given the ability to see like John on Patmos, he was able to be called up and see the things which were prophetic. And Jude was able to write this letter. He said that in, the first, in this chapter that pressure was put upon him. He could not write what he wanted to write. He had to write what the Spirit of God told him to write. And God let him see the rapture and he let him see the revelation. And he said, the Lord's coming with ten thousands of his saints. What that means is he looked up and he looked at the 
people redeemed by the blood of Jesus that's following Him. It's just like he started counting. One, two, three. I can't do it that way. Five, ten, fifteen. Can't do it that way. Ten, twenty, thirty. Can't do it that way. One hundred, two hundred, three hundred. Can't do it that way. One thousand, two thousand. Can't do it that way. So when they, when they, when they, when they looked up and they, they, they noticed a number that was so large they couldn't count it, they would use a phrase which means an innumerable company. And so when Jude said, the Lord's coming with ten thousands of his saints, What Jude is literally saying is, the Lord's coming, and He is coming with an innumerable company of believers. And you know what? When Jude said that, he saw you and he saw me. I'm in that crowd. That's my crowd. (laughs) That's my crowd. Now, Jude's talking about the revelation because the next verse, he's going to execute, execute judgment upon all and he's going to convince all. So, <laughs> the Lord's coming. Now, look back in our text chapter, the 17th chapter of Luke. I said the teachings of Jesus demands that he come. Look at Luke 17:30. Jesus talked about it. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Notice. The teachings of Jesus demands that He come. He Himself said, if you read Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, He goes into great detail about His coming. I quoted it this morning. I love it. One of the the great chapters in the Bible, 14th chapter of John, Jesus said, I will come again. He's coming. Why is He coming? Because the promises of the Old Testament demand that He come and... The teachings of Jesus Himself demand that He come. He said, I'll be back. Back during the war, you remember the story of General Douglas MacArthur. When he waded out in those waters, and he said, I shall return. I like it. General MacArthur went back. He went back and he helped procure the the freedoms for a percentage of our world. He was a great representative of our nation. He led a great group of men and women into arm's way. And he, and he brought freedom to a large part of the world. And he brought, he, and he continued the freedoms that we, that we hold dear. Something could have happened, however, and General MacArthur uh, could have, uh, although been sincere when he said, I shall return, but something could have happened and prevented him from going back. But thank God he went back. But Jesus said, I shall return. I will come again. Listen, there's not enough devils in hell. There's not enough demons on top side of this earth. There's not enough opposing forces in the universe of God's creation that will prevent him from coming because he personally said, I'm coming again. I'm glad he is. And I know everything's on schedule because the promises of the Old Testament remain to be fulfilled. Jesus himself said he's coming. Thirdly, the word of the Holy Spirit says he's coming. Turn in your Bibles to the book of the Revelation, chapter 3. The book of the Revelation, chapter number 3, to the church of Philadelphia. I want you to notice what the Bible says. Revelation chapter 3, verse number 11. Now, this goes along with the last point first. Revelation chapter 3, verse number 11. Behold, I come quickly. Now, that's the message to the church. He said, I'm coming quickly. There won't be a countdown in Houston or Cape Kennedy. You won't see a rocket ship on the launching pad with the smoke coming out. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and it blasts off. The truth of the matter is, the countdown started 2,000 years ago when the Bible said in Hebrews 1 that He hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. And the countdown right now is is coming down to the zero hour, just like He came in the fullness of time. According to the book of Galatians, He's going to come again in the fullness of His time and and rapture and rescue His church out of this world. And he said that here to the church of Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love that was undergoing persecution. And uh, he said, uh, "He said, I behold, I come quickly. Now, it is my personal observation. You may disagree with this. That's all right. It is my personal observation that it is the church of Philadelphia. And as you know, these churches represent seven eras of time in the dispensation of grace. You can go back and trace each one of these churches in church history. 
you can find that particular church in church history. It is my personal opinion that we are now in this church age. We are intermingling with the Laodicean church age. It is my belief, and I think I can substantiate this in, in Scripture, it is my belief that the Laodicean church is not a church that is saved. <clears throat> Jesus said, you're not hot or cold. Jesus said, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. If you know anything about that, that's rejection. I believe it's the Philadelphia church that goes out that the Laodicean church is the apostate church that goes into the tribulation to join up with the Antichrist to become the apostate church in the tribulation period. And Jesus is saying here to the church of Philadelphia, verse number 11, and I believe it's a, I believe it's a reference to the church age in which we're now living, Behold, I come quickly. And the Bible in the book of 1 Corinthians tells us how, that, how quick that is. It's a moment. The word moment is a Greek word which means a time or space so small that it can no longer be calculated. He's coming in a moment. He's coming in the twinkling of an eye. My pastor, I remember him saying this years ago, he said, let me tell you what the twinkling of an eye is. Now, I'm not throwing off on anybody. I'm just telling you what he said. He said the twinkling of an eye is when you're sitting at a stoplight. And you're waiting for the light to change. And somebody is sitting behind you. And when the light changes before you can put your foot on the gas, they're blowing the horn at you, behind you, to go through the light. He said, that's the twinkling of an eye. Now, I was going to Baptist Hospital a few years ago. I was going up Peter Street Parkway. I stopped there at Academy to turn left to go to the Baptist Hospital, and the light changed, and I was pushing on the gas, actually moving, and the person behind me was blowing their horn. I looked in my rearview mirror, and there was a, an, an elderly lady driving the car and an elderly man sitting on the other side. And I looked in my mirror when she blowed the horn, and she was doing like that. Well, I go up Academy. I go up to Hawthorne. The light's red. I stop at the light. The light changes before I can put my foot on the gas she blowed the horn at me again. And she done this. Well, I thought maybe there's a, an emergency. But she didn't have her lights on. She didn't have her flashers on. So I went down to the Baptist Hospital where you turned left. The light was red. I'm thinking to myself, I wonder if I'm going to have to put up with this all the way to the parking lot. The light changed, and before I could get my foot on the gas, she blowed her horn, and she did. I turned left. I went out about a block where you turn in to the Baptist Hospital. You go just a few feet, you turn left, and you turn into the parking deck. So help me. I pulled up to where you get the ticket. I punched that little button, and while I'm punching that button, she's blowing her horn, and she said... I got out of my car. And I walked back to this lady and I said, Lady, do you have a problem? I thought she did. She said, No. I said, Why are you blowing at your horn at me? I said, Is your husband sick? So help me, here's what she said. No, but he had a heart attack several years ago. And then she said, I wish you'd move so I could get in the parking deck. I'll leave it with that. Now, he's coming in a moment. He's coming in the twinkling, the twinkling of an eye. The Philadelphian church, watch it closely. Watch it closely. Verse 11, Revelation 3, Behold, I come quickly. Now, I said He's coming again because the Spirit of God says He's coming. Move up, please, to verse 13. He that hath an ear, 
let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. What does the Spirit say unto the churches? Verse 11. He's quoting Jesus. The Spirit is God. The Spirit is Jesus. God is Spirit. Jesus is full of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is quoting Jesus. The work of one's the work of all. And the Holy Spirit of God is confirming in verse number 13 that Jesus in verse number 11 is coming again. By the way, the Spirit of God is the author of the book. And every time in the Bible it says He's coming, that is a statement of by the Holy Spirit of God because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. This Bible is God-breathed. So anything in here is the product of the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit of God says, Jesus is coming again. I'm going to give you one other one. I'll give you one other one. Let me tell you why I know Jesus is coming again. Because God's plan for the church demands that He come. God's plan for the church demands that He come. God says, turn in your Bibles. Turn to the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. I'll give you this. Okay. God's plan for His church demands that He come. Verse 29 of Romans chapter 8, For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, I'm not going to get into this. This is not Calvinistic doctrine. This is the Word of God. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, them He also called. Whom He called, them He also justified. And whom He justified, them He also glorified. Once again, I call your attention to the tense, the tenses of these words, these phrases. All of them are in past tense. Those that God foreknew, notice what it says. He called them. The calling of God is based on the foreknowledge of God, 1 Peter 1. Based on the fact that God knows our response to Him. He doesn't coerce us. He doesn't force us. But He, being God, knows ahead of time what we will do. And based on His knowledge of us, he can put a plan into place. And that's exactly what he did. And so God said, I want you to get a hold of this. If you ever get a hold of this, it'll revolutionize your life. I want you to notice the Bible said that those he started to work in and predestinate. By the way, let me say this. Predestination has absolutely nothing to do with a sinner. Predestination, as it is used in the New Testament, <clears throat> means to determine beforehand... And it is in reference to a child of God. As a matter of fact, he did predestinate, verse number 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. God knew that you would get saved, you would trust his Son, and before time, he had a will for your life, God had a program for your life, and the program for your life was that everybody that trust His Son will be conformed to the image of His Son. That was God's plan for your life in eternity past that would kick in when you got saved. God said, I'm going to fix it so if they so choose, if they will allow me to, I'll conform them to my Son. He wants us to be more like Jesus. Now you come down to verse number 30, those that He did predestinate, He called... What do you call him? To be conformed to his son. He just told you in the previous verse. And those that he called, them he also justified. He treats us as if we've never sinned. And everybody, look at the last part of verse 3. Everybody that's justified, he also, what's the word? 
If you're justified tonight, you're going to be... He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, I know He's coming because of the work that He's promised to do to the church. The work that, he, the, the, that He's promised, God's plan to the church demands that He come again because God's plan to the church is, <clears throat> when it's all said and done, we're going to be glorified. Now watch it closely. In the economy of God, it's already an established fact. Those He justified, past tense, He glorified. I'm going to have a body that won't have any more kidney stones. If they are, they'll be glorified and they won't hurt. I'm going to have a body that will no longer grow old. I'm going to have a body that will no longer be animated by blood, but by spirit. And so are you. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and the blood's been contaminated by sin. And that contamination through the blood in our body reaches every part of our body. and carries the diseases to every part of our body. When Jesus came out on the other side of the grave... He said, touch me, for a spirit hath not flesh and bone, as you see me have, no blood. His blood had already been shed to cleanse us. He took His blood black back to heaven to take care of us till we get to glory. But He did not have blood in His glorified body, although He could eat. That's one reason why I believe in the Perpetuity of the Baptist. I think when the Methodists get to heaven, they're going to find out that Jesus was a Baptist. You know why? He liked to eat. And if there was a shortage, he would see to it that the loaves and the fishes turned into enough food to feed everybody with 12 baskets full left over. Why? They like to eat. On the other side, man, I found all kinds of justification here to get out and turn eat. Now, on the other side of the grave, he ate fish and a bowl of honeycomb and a glorified body. You say, preacher, what's the glorified body going to be like? Read 1 Corinthians 15, you'll find out. Sown in weakness. That's going to be raised in power. Sown in corruption, but it's going to be raised incorruptible. Do you notice what he says death is to a Christian? It's a seed that's sown. It is sown in weakness. It is sown in corruption. Why do you use that phrase? Because when you put a seed, I'm getting blessed by my own preaching. You're going to have to just hold the mule just a minute. They went to the old man that sang in the choir and said, Now you're going to have to put this shouting, you're disturbing me. They sent a delegation out to the field where he was plowing, and they said, You're going to have to, you're going to, have to quit this. And you're just making too much noise in the church. And, By the way, why do you do it? And he gave them the history of his new birth. He said, I used to be a rebel, a sinner, a drunkard, an alcoholic. I met the master one day and he changed me and I turned liquor into food for my kids. And I turned alcohol into clothes for my children. And God saved me and he's going to take me to heaven someday. He said, here, hold the reins. I feel a shouting spell coming on. Shouted all over the field. I'm just here to tell you that this body that's sown, catch the phrase, a seed that's planted. And when you plant a seed, that seed is planted not to lie dormant. That seed is planted to come up. These bodies are sown. Sown. Why does he use that terminology? Because they're coming out. They're coming out. My dear dad and mom, 
my wife's dad and mom, in the same building, Park Lawn Memorial Cemetery, right over here off Finch Creek Park Lane. Uh, when that trumpet sounds, mom's coming out, dad's coming out. Her mom and dad's going to come out. We used to leave church property on Sunday and go over to her mom and dad's house, and her mom would fix dinner. And boy, she was a cook. She never looked at a recipe. She just went in the kitchen and started throwing. And she could fix some of the best food, just like my mom. My mom could fix apple pie that would cause your tongue to slap your brains out while you're eating it. My mom was some kind of a cook, and so was her mom. And we used to get together after church, and we'd go over to her mom's house, and me and my wife and kids and, and her parents and my parents, we'd all sit down around the table, and we'd eat and enjoy the fellowship. It just seems like a few days ago. Now that the house sits empty. I don't see my mom and dad sitting here any longer. I sure miss them. But we've shown them. And here we come out. Because Jesus said, I'm coming. No wonder it's called the blessed hope. That's exactly what it is. If in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. But our hope rests in the empty tomb. Jesus is alive to come back and fulfill His promises. He's going to take us out of here. I want to see my aunt. I've caught myself a few times starting in that direction. It just doesn't seem possible. But I'm going to see her again. Thank God the next time I see her, she won't have a trick in. The next time I see Dad... He won't be out of his head a lot. The act of glorification is going to set everything straight that's wrong. I enjoy living. I enjoy the blessings of God. I try to occasionally think about, I love to be around God's people. I love to be around the people I pastor. I'm always glad to get back when I'm out of town. I'm always glad to be back here. And I, quite, I think of it quite often. What we enjoy here three times a week, we're going to be able to enjoy together forever. The Lord's coming and the family's going to go home. We're going to meet again. We're going to meet again. And I'm encouraged tonight because He's coming. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Our Father, I thank you tonight for the blessed hope that in fact our hope lies in you, our Savior. You've taught us because you live, we shall live also. We realize as this outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Lord, help us to remain encouraged and strengthen in our inner man as we anticipate, as we look forward to the great reunion when we shall be, meet in your presence on the hills of glory. Thank you that you are the King omnipotent. Thank you that you are who you are. 
that you are what you are to us, the believers. Help us tonight. Oh, God, help us tonight to fall in love with you all over again for all you mean to us. Speak to us tonight. God, help us tonight. Minister to us during this invitation. Lord, you've been real in this place tonight. Now allow us to allow you to be real in our lives the way you desire to be. And we'll thank you for it. Because we ask in Jesus' name. If others need to make your way down here, we're going to sing a stanza. Make your way down here while the Spirit of God might be speaking to you. If He is, don't wait. You do what God would lead you to do tonight as we sing this stanza.